So again, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, guests from St. Joseph, as well as from other parishes and visitors from other states joining us on Zoom. Uh, we welcome you to uh, the Universal Us, uh, breaking open Pope Francis's uh, encyclical Fratelli Tutti. Um, this will be actually the first of two presentations uh, that we will be doing on uh, this particular encyclical. The first tonight will uh, break open a little bit more about the Holy Father's letter and the points that he's trying to address to the faithful. The second part, which will take place after the Christmas holidays at a date to be scheduled and announced, um, will address more of how do local parishes apply what the Holy Father's message is in their daily ministry operation. Uh, to begin with, and before we introduce um, our presenters, again, that this meeting is being recorded, you will have the ability to view it at your leisure and we will have the link posted on our website um, and within the next day or so uh, after this. Um, our presenter uh, this evening, uh, we unfortunately regret to inform you that one of our presenters um, is not going to be joining with us, uh, Dr. Paul Dekeke, excuse me. Uh, Dr. Dekeke unfortunately had some personal business that he could not um, prevent from happening and is dealing with that and regretfully um, will not be joining us. However, we hope to see him in the future. Um, our other two presenters are going to be joining us. Um, our pastor, Father John Trout, who is going to be leading off the presentation, uh, will be talking and speaking first, followed by uh, his fellow colleague, um, uh, Dr. Robert Borman, uh, from the Professor Emeritus from the Institute of Pastoral Studies at Loyola University, who's also done extensive studies on Pope Francis and specifically has been doing in-depth study on fraternity. Uh, so we welcome you gentlemen, um, Father Trout, uh, if you'd like to begin the presentation, I will bring up the opening prayer. Okay, good. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this presentation. Uh, we are going to begin with uh, a prayer. So we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will lead you in prayer. Lord, Father of our human family, you created all human beings equal in dignity. Pour forth into our hearts a fraternal spirit, and inspire us to dream of renewed encounter, dialogue, justice, and peace. Move us to create healthier societies and a more dignified world, a world without hunger, poverty, violence, and war. May our hearts be open to all the peoples and nations of the earth. May we recognize the goodness and beauty that you have sown in each one of us, and thus forge bonds of unity, common projects, and shared dreams. Amen. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Um, uh, I'm on screen now. Okay, very good. So, welcome everybody to uh, this uh, Fratelli Tutti uh, reflection. And um, I want to, first of all, express my profound gratitude to uh, Bob O'Gorman, Professor Bob O'Gorman, and Professor Paul Dukeki. We first met with each other back in the year 2000. And uh, it is wonderful that we have sustained a relationship uh, since then. And even uh, I was very blessed when I was in South Africa to have uh, Paul or to have Bob and his wife, Mary Lou, or Mary Lou as the Africans call her, um, to, uh, to come and visit me while I was there as well. And we did participate in, in a workshop there. Um, a lot of the, the stimulus for what we are doing is, is something that I introduced in our parish was, was um, with a question that resonated deeply with people. Are you, um, as, as quoting Cardinal Supic, are you going to be the last of your generation of Catholics in your family? Now that, is, um, that was a, a great challenge and the people responded to it um, in a very wonderful way. So what uh, my dream for, for uh, our parish here at St. Joe's is that uh, we will be the first of a new generation um, in building a new way of being church. And that's very much a, a, a whole theme of Francis' pontificate, building a new way of being church. 
So as our parishioners know me um, and know of me here, that uh, they know I love stories. So a lot of my presentation is going to be through a story. And I want to begin this story, the first story about when I was uh, visiting and about to work in South Africa, I had the great privilege of meeting um, Archbishop Dennis Hurley. He was then um, Emeritus Archbishop of Durban in South Africa. Now, some of you may not know about him, but he really was a very profound, um, saintly and uh, deeply spiritual. You knew you were in the presence of greatness when you were in his presence. I remember very distinctly that uh, my friend and colleague, uh, we, we collected him from his house and we brought him to a restaurant. And while my friend went to park his car, I walked in with him into the restaurant. And as we walked in, the place went quiet. And all his staff there were young Africans. They all stood. And it was nearly as if they stood to attention because of who he was. Because um, apart from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, Archbishop Harley was at the forefront of dismantling the apartheid state in South Africa. And he worked very, very, very diligently and forcefully to bring about what is the new South Africa uh, that people are, are um, that we take for, um, that we, we see now as normal. So um, while I was with him at the table, he, we had a wonderful conversation and uh, he, he shared different uh, ideas with me. We spoke at length. He was telling me that um, he joined the, Arch he joined the uh, bishops of South Africa in their ad liminal visit to the Vatican. And at that time he was retired, but he said he would go along. So he was in the, the grouping of the bishops when they had their private meeting with John Paul II. And uh, at the end of the meeting, coming towards the end of it, um, the Pope, St. John Paul II said, okay, I'm going to ask your bishops to leave an archbishop, please stay. And he said to him, I would like some private time with my good friend, Dennis Hurley. So that was, that will show you the stature that he had. He was the youngest bishop at Vatican II and uh, one of the longest serving in, in, in all of the commissions that came from Vatican II. So um, he, he said something very, very profound. He said, never in the history of the church has there been such a gathering of minds, of brilliant minds, great theologians. Never has there been a moment when they've come together at that special time in that special place. So he said, the, the beauty and the treasures of Vatican II, he said, it is so important that people, people keep visiting them and keep, keep taking uh, guidance from them and, and deep, delving deeper into the, 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 the great treasures that, that Vatican II, that legacy that has been given to us. One of the ones that um, I, um, and I'm, I'm telling you this, I know I'm a little bit off base here, but I'm telling you this to try and give you some background to where Pope Francis is coming from. And one of the, the very uh, great movements that happened from Vatican II was that whole idea of resourcement to go back to the sources, to go back to the ways of the early church. And this is, um, this is something that's, uh, that is, uh, you, can, you can never uh, stop doing it. It is something that you learn more and more and more from. I just received the book this afternoon and, and um, you know, I was reading through it probably um, like a kid late doing his homework. But uh, one, one line just that just struck me was that it said that um, uh, it said, it's quoted, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. And, he, and the writer says that, that, that that's, that's incorrect because in the early centuries, there was no word for the true understanding of that word. You are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my community. 
because there was no word for the word ecclesia meant community. But with time, it became more identified with a building and an institution. So if I use the word community instead of church, when I'm saying mass, it would uh, certainly give a very different feel and a different flavor. And that is why we have to go back to the sources. And one of the greatest sources to understanding what we are doing and what we are about is the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. That's, that's Luke 24, uh, 12 to 35. Now these, the disciples were part of Jesus's community. They were part of that. But after his passion and death, um, they, um, they, they, they were leaving. They were walking away. They were, they were abandoning the movement, abandoning what Jesus was about. So they were returning to their natural community of their village and away from the movement that Jesus is trying to bring about. As they were walking, we all know the story, Jesus walked by their side. And then they asked the question, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know what was happening? He was the only one who knew what was happening. And then there was, um, from that, there was, uh, as Jesus walked along, he opened the word of God to them. Now, this is a very important point. He opened the word of God to them. So that is one, one thing that, that's, that, that is, we, we, we learn from is a collective contemplation of the word of God. And from there then, their hearts burned within them. And with their hearts burning, with that collective contemplation, they were coming to know Christ once again. And uh, then when they, it was dark in an evening and they were going into their home, they opened their home to a stranger. And in opening the home to the stranger and offering him food, giving him hospitality, their eyes were opened and they recognized that Christ is present among them. And that is the, the, the whole, um, that is the whole beauty of the early faith community. That's where it was first. They were the first ever in the history of our faith, going back to the very beginning of the beginning of the Old Testament. They were the first disciples, community of faith, to gather around the presence of the risen Lord in their midst. So it was, uh, it was, it was something that was, um, something that they, that was unheard of in history ever before. That this is a community of faith that gathered around the presence of the risen Lord in their midst. And in their gathering and in the way they gathered, they would make that presence manifest to themselves and to other people as well. So the priority, first of all, was the relationships that they had with each other, coming together in relationship. And the relationships of disciples gathering in his name. When two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So they're gathering in his name. And when they gathered in his name, they shared the word of God. It was a collective contemplation of the word of God. And through that collective contemplation and sharing on the word of God, the word of God was spoken to them in their particular situation at that moment. What was going on in their life, they were able to hear the voice of the Lord speaking to them in the life situation that they were in at the moment, at that time. And then we see that um, there was also care for the widows and orphans. Um, we see how the deacons were brought in to help uh, distribute the food, to help care for other people. And they're the three building blocks of, 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 uh, of the early church. And um, so when, when the, the, the fathers of Vatican II went backwards, that's what they went backwards to. And that is what, that is what they wanted to, to bring a restore as, as normative in, in the church of today. And so when they met to discuss the church 
and uh, the documents on the church. The, um, <clears throat> the initial document that they were given was um, that it started with the Pope and the Cardinals and the bishops, the hierarchy. And the council father said, no, they threw out that document. Instead, they started with, they said, the most important thing we can start it is with the people. So it was, you could say, a revolution at that time. It was a whole different way of looking at the church. And that's where the term, the people of God came from. Now that understanding of the church, the community, as the people of God, is what the council fathers wanted uh, to bring forth into the world for all Catholics throughout the world. Now, at the same time as this was going on, there was a, a very wonderful priest who became a bishop, Bishop Rossi. And he was a, he, he was a priest at the time, and uh, he had a huge diocese in Brazil, or not a huge parish. It was literally massive, and there was just two priests in there, and thousands of villages and towns that he could never get to in a year. So as he was visiting one place as a bishop, um, I've told this story before, an old woman came to him and said, it was, must have been after Christmas, and said to him, um, you know, on Christmas, on Christmas Eve, he says, the Catholic Church was in complete darkness. But he said, but she said, all the other churches, the evangelical churches, the Protestant churches, they were crowded, the lights were on, there was prayer, there was music, there was worship. So this led to a huge a, a change. In, in the approach that the bishops in particular of Brazil and of Latin America worked at. Um, and it was creating uh, what they call basic ecclesial communities. Um, and these base ecclesial communities were to be, the, the, the people of God would take priority. They were lay led. Um, and in, in a very short time, Bishop Rossi had 372 people's catechists trained to lead the people in, in faith, to reflect on the, the Bible and to develop an identity as a community of Catholics. So that is what, um, what, what happened next. He, he, uh, and then the Brazilian bishops took it up and uh, bishops from other dioceses or other countries in Latin America took it up as well. And in a very short time, it spread like wildfire. And it was certainly, uh, <coughs> encouraged with um, and bolstered by the understanding of the church as the people of God. Actually, when that document came out, there were the only Episcopal conferences uh, to, to actually reflect on that document that came from Vatican II on the church. And they endeavored to make this a reality in, in the lives of people and uh, to, to make what we call the church today a community of communities scattered in every corner of the world. And, and, and you can see this in the Pope's writing, how he talks about respect for, for people's culture, for, for people's place, and, and the importance of evangelizing, and, and the importance of having a presence in people's lives and every community, no matter where they are, they are and they're at. Pope Paul VI said it, uh, put it beautifully, they are the building blocks of a civilization of love. So that is uh, some of the background I could go on at great length because so much has been written on this. But I want to kind of fast forward to my own experience in, in Lagos, Nigeria as a missionary. I was 28 when I went to Lagos, Nigeria um, it was not a place I really wanted to go to because some of our missionaries were being reassigned from there to more exciting places um, like um, South Africa, which was coming out of apartheid. And um, a lot of people wanted to go and work there and build a new nation, including me. But instead, I was sent to, to Lagos, Nigeria. So I went there and um, reluctantly, but I had to go because that was our rule. Um, you go where wherever the superior general sends you. So I went there and my first appointment was to a parish called St. Mary's. And St. Mary's was in a, in, a, in a huge, huge township, excuse me, 
And um, the locals called it Jungle City. And uh, wow, it was, it was teeming with people, very vibrant, very alive. You know, I think at the time, the population of, Nig of Lagos, the population of Nigeria today is over 200 million. And 50% of the people are under the age of 25. Um, the population of Lagos um, back then probably was somewhere in the region of, of uh, 10 million people. So it was a place that was teeming with people. People were everywhere. It was vibrant, it was alive. So we had a big church and we had two outstations, CKC Oja Road and the St. Teresa's in Marine Beach. So we would alternate and go around to the different parishes saying mass on Sundays and during the week as well. However, in the evening time, uh, we would have dinner in the evening around 6.30 and then afterwards, um, they had this tradition of walking like in the cool of the evening and saying the rosary. So by 7.30, they would retire to the rooms. I was 28 years of age because I'm not going into my bed at like 7.30 in the evening. So then, um, you know, I was kind of surplus to requirement apart from saying mass because they had all had their, their groups that they worked with and uh, I was new. So I began to walk the streets. Um, I had a white, we wore white cassocks then. So apart from the color of my skin, I stood out uh, uh, as I walked the streets. And these were very poor areas that I walked the streets of. Now, at, initially it was probably a little bit embarrassing and uncomfortable just walking. And, you know, there was, would have been, because I was new, a little bit of fear there as well. But you know, in a short time, the um, people would approach me and they would, have, they would be getting to know me because of my saying mass in the parishes. And they would invite me very graciously to their homes. Now I learned a very important lesson was never refuse hospitality from poor people because they're welcoming you to their homes and they want to show you respect so eventually I got into the habit of asking for a bottle of Coke and a straw because I would be visiting many different houses every night. Well, there weren't houses, there were rooms. There were rooms that were probably 12 feet by eight feet, thereabouts, kind of like some people's bathrooms. And that was the home where people lived in and they all lived together, mom and dad, kids, and any visitors that came as well. Very tight quarters. They had this term for you face me and I face you. So um, I would go into all of these homes and <laughs> the amazing thing was there's kids being mobbed all over. It was like I was like a, uh, like a star attraction. And, uh, and they, well, you go into the room and all the kids would come in as well and you'd sit down and you'd talk to the family and they would give me Coke. And I take the straw and I take a sip out of it. Then I'd say, will somebody help me finish this? And the kids would grab it in a second and they would be very happy. But what, I, what, I, what, what really struck me was that these were people who came from their villages to a huge city that was teeming. Now in their villages, they had a great sense of identity. They had a great sense of support because they were all from the same tribe, the same village for generations. And uh, they came from a very safe environment to a very hostile environment in, in Lagos. It was incredibly difficult for them to live there. Actually, when I was visiting Bob in the year 2000, uh, one of his friends who was a doctor at Vanderbilt and did some work in Africa, I can't remember his name, Bob, but he said- Antarpley. Antarpley, thank you. But he was in his, uh, in his um, practice, and he was with another church going out there. One of the greatest problems for them was um, sleep deprivation. The place was as noisy as you could not imagine. Now I used to, I suffered from that as well, and I do, I don't think I've ever recovered from from it because, um, like you know, you you you're going without sleep for 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 for, for the whole year long. Um, and nearly impossible to get sleep because 
it's like there's nightclubs there's some African versions of nightclubs and the music is blaring all of the time and then you have the local churches and they would be casting demons out of Aladuras they would be uh, casting demons out of people at a two and three o'clock in the morning with those huge old-fashioned horn speakers yelling and screaming come out come out come out and all of this and they'd be screaming the pastor would be screaming and you're <laughs> lying in your bed dripping with the heat wide awake impossible to sleep and you'd be just nodding off to get to sleep at five o'clock in the morning the ibmans will start allah akbar and then they're <laughs> off for the day again so it was very very tough so their living conditions were very tough and and i remember very distinctly you know um that is that um, that one of the places I went to, you know, it was a place called. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. But I, I I kept visiting and visiting, and I started then to people would kind of connect with me in the same area, and I tried to organize them to come around to meet once a week, and then we would I would get them to share on the word of God, and it was something beautiful. So I was only there for a short time, and I went in to visit uh, the Archbishop Cardinal Okoji at the time. And uh, you know, one thing that uh, you learn to try and stay ahead is that you have to learn to read upside down very quickly. What is on the bishop's desk when uh, when when he calls you in to meet him, <laughs> so because you have to be prepared for what's coming next. So what was on his desk was a request from a bishop in Ireland that three of his priests would come, three or four of them would come out and work with the St. Patrick's missionaries. So that meant then that I was being moved and I was being moved to a new suburb called K2, St. Michael's in K2. <clears throat> and, uh, and the Cardinal drove, I went with him and he stopped and showed me, this is where you're, it is going to be. He showed me a piece of land that was partially filled in with sand, partially swamp. And he said, this is your church. And he, this is where you build a church because, um, because the community was tribally divided. There were two different groups and there were two different locations. So that's why he said, this is where you will be. So that's what, uh, why he came with me that first time. So there wasn't a, a church there. There was a, um, a roof that would keep off the sun and rain, a cement floor. And, and that, was, that was it. It wasn't even walled around. Um, but it also gave me a great opportunity because people were disengaging. They would come to mass and they would leave, which was very unusual in Africa. But there wasn't a great sense of identity with the church because to join a group was to take sides and was nearly like to enter and link to the division. So that gave me a great opportunity with another priest, Father Johnny O'Rourke. And um, for several weeks, we put on um, every Sunday, we had a lesson in creating small Christian communities. And every week at Sunday Mass, we led the people through an awareness building. And then we invited anybody who would like to join us, to be part of the team, to come. And I got probably 50, 60. Uh, they were all quite young, young, young people, you know, young adults. Uh, either working or uh, graduates um, because they're incredibly hard workers and very intelligent and, and they bought into this very strongly. And then we basically sent them out two by two out onto the streets and I mm. said start mm. with your own area. And they went out and they started with their own areas and we ended up with 40 or 50 communities, vibrant communities of faith. And um, there is a few of them I would just like to share and um, some of the stories that came from them. Like one of them was an area called Agilogo. Now, even though the places were moderate to poor, they were like not well off. Agilogo was probably the poorest of the poorest areas. And um, the local government didn't want to do anything there. No electricity, no sewage, no water no development whatsoever, because they didn't want people squatting and putting up, if you want to use the word, a shanty town there, even though there were some very nice homes there, but they weren't investing it at all. So even though we couldn't change at that time, the plight of the people 
um, living there. Um, I saw one woman with a, a newborn child in this small room. She was sick with a newborn baby there. And, and the flood waters, the swamp waters were halfway up the, the legs of the bed. And, and there's nowhere she could go. There's nothing I could do for her. It was just, but, but, but where I'm getting at is that, the, um, that there was a wonderful community of faith there. And even though they couldn't actually do anything to fix their situation, um, that sense of solidarity, that sense of being in this together and being there for each other, give them encouragement to keep going, even though it was very difficult at that time. Another, it's funny how sometimes the poorest places you get the best stories from. Another one was Bram Biafra. That was, that was not an easy place to get into. That was, um, that was uh, in a place called, oh, what was it called? Mile 12 or something. I can't remember the name. It's a long time ago. But I remember being there <clears throat> and uh, at, at one of the meetings and, and one, of the, one of the women said, um, when you know people are used to the seven steps when we come to that action area, one woman just said very, very gently, she says, I need some help. And uh, people said, well, what is wrong? And you could all understand and identify with her. She came from a tribe of people in which it was crucially important that her husband who was sick and was dying, that he would, uh, that she needed to get him back to his village before he died so that he could be buried there. Because if he died in Lagos, she would never get the money uh, that was necessary to get him back there. And also then if she didn't do that, her, she and her kids would be ostracized from that community, that village. And that would be a very um, vulnerable thing that would happen to them. They would, never, they would never welcome there and they wouldn't have a sense of identity and a belonging there as well. Because being in that group would give them a great a safety net as well. So she spoke about this and um, I, I was amazed. It was like a finely, finely oiled machine. How the people just came around and said, okay. And um, some of the men said they will help carry him to the bus stop in the morning with her. Some of the other women said they will look after the kids. But, but the big issue was everybody didn't have a ton of food to spare. So eventually it was agreed that we would gather the next night and everybody would bring some food. So I brought uh, quite an amount of food. And um, I remember sitting down, I think it was a bag of rice, fairly big one. And um, then I could see that, you know, I didn't see any food from any of the other people. So initially I was a bit disappointed. But then when it said at the end of prayer, please bring the food, it was quite remarkable. It was like the miracle of the loaves and fishes. So much food appeared. And then they gathered up all that food. It was so beautiful. And they put it on their heads and they danced and went down and gave it to the woman. And then she was able to be, to leave with her husband. Um, and, and, um, and, and it was an important point for the people as well, because there was, um, there was a great sense that if we are in, in need, there's a community here that will support us. I have a community of faith that will stand by me. Then the last point I would make is in another community, I can't think of the name of it, but we would be sharing and linking the word of God to our life experience. And people would come at that in different ways. Um, often there would, there would be, what you would be hoping when you'd start a community like this is that initially the sharing would be very stunted and very formal. And there wouldn't be much kind of depth to it. And sometimes it's like cracking an egg. Once somebody, you know, once the trust is built up, once somebody, if you could say for the better word, has the courage to become vulnerable and share what is going on in their life at that time, it's amazing the transformation that comes into the group because it gives permission to the other people to become vulnerable as well. Now, at that time, I was reading a, a book by Pope Benedict. And this lady, who would probably be working for one or two dollars a day in the market, sitting in the heat, selling fruit on the side of the road all day long, 
and coming home then and feeding her kids and coming to this meeting and sitting down. And she began to share about the gospel at that time and her life. I'm not joking you. I could have taken Pope Benedict's reflection on what he was talking about and hers. And they were absolutely identical. So there was a very deep uh, sense of, uh, it was a theology from the bottom up and a spirituality from the bottom up. And one of my great regrets is that um, that I never documented it. And if I had the chance over again, I would do that because it, it could be a very profound book. Now I'm telling you all of this because this is the background out of which Francis is coming from. Pope Francis is a very strong advocate of what is called basic ecclesial communities. Now, um, there's a quote here that, oh, where is it gone? I've been studying like crazy all this stuff, but there's a quote that I'd like to, I'll find it. But it is saying that, um, I thought I underlined it, but it's basically saying that, that, that the, these small communities are a paradigm shift in ecclesiology in our understanding of the church. That, 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 that the, when people gather in the name, in the small groups, these communities of faith with relationships, with the gospel, with caring for each other, he actually said that Christ is present there. That, that they, oh, give me one second. Too many notes. So it is saying that it is, when the groups bond as, as in the relationships, when they develop the trust that their sharing goes to a deeper level, and when they're inspired to care for other people, that Christ in the flesh is made manifest in that group. The risen Lord is made, and that is the goal of these groups, that they make manifest to each other and to other people, the actual risen Christ in their midst. So um, there has been a bit of a battle between the bishops of Latin America and the Vatican, the Curia. Those guys I'm not a fan of. Um, because even Pope Francis, when he was Archbishop and Cardinal, he had to battle with them as well, especially in his docking a Paradiso and how they wanted to kind of just, um, you know, kind of uh, destroy it really and destroy what was coming from the bishops. And so what, what he said was like, the church is a community of faithful, including St. Joe's, but including the small groups that we have here at St. Joe's. They are equal in every way, in theology, spirituality, sacramentally. They are all equal. And that is the important point that that it is not just like the Legion of Mary, the Knights of Columbus. It's not just another group. And that is why it is, it is why I have such passion for it because I have seen the risen Lord made manifest in people's lives through these groups. And when you experience it and see it, it is, it is truly miraculous. And it is a beautiful thing to see. And I would even go to so far as to say, you can nearly feel his presence there. You can sense, as you would sense another person near you, you would sense another presence there when it gets to that level. And this is very beautiful to see. Pope Francis wants to make these the gift of the Latin American church to the universal church. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of amazed that um, that so few bishops take uh, basic ecclesial communities as if they don't even exist. And, and part of the reason why they probably don't like them is that we had, um, because what they're calling for is, is, is a restructuring of the church, turning the pyramid upside down. We all know 
the bad things can happen when the hierarchy, not when the hierarchy, when the when the Korea are um, are running the church. It's a disaster. Um, and that's what we need to do. There is a place for the hierarchy in the church, but it is secondary. They're there to help facilitate, to structure, to organize, to, to help in the deepening of people's faith by connecting their reflections with the beautiful tradition of the teachings of the church. But they are secondary and the people are primary. And this is what Vatican II said in the document on the church. And this is what, uh, that the only thing that didn't happen was the structures didn't change. So that is something that hopefully will happen in time. And um, it is what the vision of Vatican II, but it was also the vision of Christ and the vision of the early church as well. So that, um, that that it, and, and the communities, the basic ecclesial communities are a movement of the Holy Spirit. That is why every time I lead a meeting on them, I say, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. So I am constantly, uh, they're a movement of the Holy Spirit and um, they are a new way of being church that Pope Francis wants to bring. And a lot of um, the document of Fratelli Tutti is going to be emphasized in, in, in a loving community of faith, a people who gather that bring kindness into the world, a reflection of the word of God that reflects and is present in people's lives and in their cultures and the situations they find themselves in. And then as the road to Emmaus, the two disciples were open to welcoming Jesus, come and stay with us, for it is nearly evening, a welcoming of the other and a showing of hospitality to them as well. Now I've spoken more than I should have and um, I'm going to take a little break now and let the professor talk. David, that's your cue. You're not giving me so much time. <laughs> David, go ahead, that's your cue. Okay. Oh, yes. um, Thank you. Andy. Go ahead, John. Dave. Do you want to say a few words, or no, not at all. I will go ahead okay. and uh, begin the uh, presentation. Okay. Sir. Very good. All right. Let me just pick up uh, where where John left off there, um, and I, I do want to say a couple of more words about our. Uh, John, go back to the first, if you would, Dave. Go back. To, yes, to the first slide. Great. Right there. Uh, right. What I want to say is, um, uh, John and I came together. I was teaching at. A Loyola University in Chicago in the late 90s when John came from Lagos. Uh, as he said, he had been ordained about 10 years and he had a little bit of R&R &R, and he was able to come to Chicago and uh, to go to Loyola University. And, and we were in class together. He was in my class, actually. And um, as we got to know each other in the class, he started telling me the story that he just told you all. And just as a background for that, Paul Dokeki, who most unfortunately isn't here tonight, Paul did a tremendous amount of work. He's the one that built the PowerPoint and, and uh, you're gonna miss a lot with Paul not being here, but it was a, at five o'clock, I got this emergency call. So he was very devastated, but um, we, we certainly wanna keep him in our prayers too tonight. But in any case, um, Paul, Paul Dokeki and I had been working, when John was working in, in Lagos uh, those years, we were working at a parish here in Nashville. And just so you're not confused, I was teaching at Loyola, uh, but I was a commuter. I went up every, for 25 years, I went up every Monday to Loyola and came back every, faithfully every Friday to, uh, to Nashville. And uh, I had established before I went to Loyola, uh, a research group with Paul and another fellow by the name of Bob Newborough. And we had connected with a Catholic parish here in, in Nashville. It, uh, Christ the King is the name of the parish. Um, and the pastor uh, was quite interested in much of what John was talking about and wanted us to do some work with him. Now, Paul and, and Bob were both connected at uh, Vanderbilt with uh, a department called the Department of Community Psychology. It eventually changed its name to the 
Department of Human uh, Development and Organization. But the focus was community psychology. And they were psychologists and I was the, the theologian. So the pastor, uh, we, we became consultants to this pastor uh, who had just taken over a parish. And uh, again, it was very much of a stodgy old parish and, and, uh, and he was trying to bring it up to date, uh, particularly out of Vatican II. So we worked with him for all of those years. And there was one concept that came out of uh, community psychology uh, that had been actually developed at Vanderbilt at Peabody. And the concept was that of sense of community. Now, if you heard John talk, that was really what he was talking about when he was talking about these people gathering in the home rather than in the churches. And John was meeting them in the homes. And he said they were seeking a sense of identity and a sense of community. And, and that phrase, sense of community, was a word we had been working with. So as John and I, particularly the, the first night or so that we met, and he started telling me his story, and he, you, I, I told him what I was doing, and I said, sense of community. He said, well, that's what I've been working on. Well, that actually was then the beginning of a very wonderful relationship that still continues today. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the third uh, person in our group, uh, Bob Newbro, died some years ago, but uh, he, his, his work was, was very significant for us as well. Anyway, John uh, eventually came down to Nashville, uh, met with uh, Bob and Paul and, and actually our pastor, and he preached, uh, I think, once or twice at least at Christ the King here in Nashville. And um, uh, we, we formed a, a, a quite a, a, a good relationship. We eventually uh, produced a, 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 an article, the four of us, for the Journal of Community Psychology, and it was on pastoral leadership. And it compared the leadership that John had done as pastor in Lagos and the leadership that uh, Jim Mallett, he was our pastor at Christ the King, had done and, uh, in, our, in our parish. And, and it, was a, it's, it's, it was a very significant article and, and, and all four of us, uh, John was actually the lead author in it, uh, but it was, a, it was a terrific piece. But the point, the point I wanna do in, in, in kind of be giving that history um, is, is to focus this phrase, sense of community. And when John was talking about the rejection of the old notion of church at Vatican II, by the, by the council fathers, it was this lifeless and very hierarchical institutional notion of church that really had nothing to do with the world. And that's what, that's what, what the, 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 the fathers at, at, at Vatican II rejected. And what they came for, as John said, was the people of God and, the, and this phrase, the sense of community, the sense of identity, is this church giving you any sense of community? And what's most important is, is that sense of community doing anything? You have an identity as a disciple. Are you doing anything in terms of other people? And John's stories tonight, you know, talked about that's where that sense of community got expressed taking care of that woman uh, in her family, and, and story after story after story. So the point of that wasn't uh, you know, to build a great church in terms of a big cathedral of some sort. The idea was it, of it was, what John had as his task there, was to build a sense of community. And those are the stories he told us. So where this comes home in terms of this evening's presentation uh, I, I want to say, Fratelli Tutti uh, really is not uh, primarily about reforming the Catholic Church. Uh, uh, Pope uh, uh, Francis at the end, and you'll see, we'll, we'll spend some time on that. He does talk about this uh, reform of the church, okay? But, but, but what, what Francis is most concerned about is the sense of community on our planet. The sense of community. And that's why we've used this phrase, the universal us, or Francis uses the phrase fratelli tutti. You know, we are all a brotherhood. We are all brothers and sisters. 
There's a sense of community. And, and what Francis is saying is that that's what is at a crisis in this world. And that's why he's writing this piece. That it's community, it's the sense of community, fratelli, the sense of community is under attack. And that's what is uh, uh, unfortunately uh, at, at peril. And so that's, that's what he writes about. Now at the end, he does certainly talk about not just the Catholic Church, but religions in general as being forces uh, in the sense of community. But, but, the, but the, the whole focus is, is, is this belief that the church is just a, a model and, and it's supposed to be an engine to bring about universal community. So, all right, kind of with that, um, let's see here. Uh, oh, I wanna say one other thing. I asked John to leave this up. Uh, John, uh, uh, David, I mean, David put this nice poster together. And, and we've said this is a two-part presentation. So tonight we're gonna get into this, this universal sense of community. And then specifically, the next time we gather, we're going to actually say, well, what does that look like in terms of a church, okay? And so one of the, one of the questions, if Francis is so big on reforming the church, one of the fair questions is saying, well, if you were pastor, uh, Francis, what would it be like? And, and interestingly enough, he was pastor. And so what we've got here in this picture, if you look at this uh, uh, picture of the priest in his vestments, that's uh, uh, Father Jorge, Jorge, uh, Jorge Bogolio, okay? That's Father Bogolio, pastor. And 40 years ago, he started this church called, interestingly enough, for you uh, folks here, uh, St. Joseph the Patriarch Church. And that's a, that's a picture of that church today. That church has been in existence for 40 years. And, and when we gather next, we're gonna use his, uh, his church, similar to what John has been talking about, as a case study and talk about what would that look like in Libertyville, uh, at St. Joseph's in Libertyville. David, let's go to the next slide, okay? David, next slide. There we go. Okay, so in this slide, um, this is this is the document for Kelly Tutti, and uh, a couple of explanations quickly of the picture. He's signing at the at the tomb of Saint Francis. Okay, uh, Saint. His, he's taken, as you all know, the name Francis. Uh, Fra one of Francis's uh, uh, w w the voice he heard was "Rebuild my church." Uh, it's very intentional that that uh, that the Pope chose that name with that notion in mind. Um, and uh, so he's, he's uh, twice now, he's, he's named uh, his uh, encyclical letters out of, uh, out of Francis. Uh, Laudato Si, with regard to the uh, creation and the, uh, the ecology of the universe and the planet uh, is, is from uh, uh, words of um, St. Francis. And here again, Fratelli Tutti, as you'll see in a moment, is, is from uh, this uh, uh, same saint. So these are just some very interesting pictures uh, showing him signing the encyclical at the tomb of St. Francis uh, back uh, in the first part of October this year. Um, and then his, his key line here, it is my desire that in this time, our time, by acknowledging the dignity of each human person, we can contribute to the rebirth of a universal aspiration to fraternity. Fraternity between all men and women, fratelli tutti, um, and um, he he uh, he then has a this this picture with his arm going out uh, is is uh, uh, wanting to say okay we've got to go forth once this health crisis passes our worst response would be to plunge even more deeply into feverish consumerism and new forms of egoistic self preservation. As you'll see in the encyclical, this is, this is the evil that has caused us to be in such dire uh, straits as, as, to, uh, as to not have a sense of community or a sense of fraternity. Um, one more piece as, I, as we go into this, and that is to say, I, I, I think for those of us in the United States who have just come out of an election 
and um, a year of, uh, of uh, and, and unfortunately continuing, and an election with such a close vote um, that, that that has caused incredible division. Um, it, it's almost as if this encyclical couldn't have come at a more appropriate time. The very thing that John was talking about in his opening about the sense of community, um, the sense of, 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 of being open and concerned for others, maybe at no other time, at least recently, have we had such hardening. It's almost a blessing this year that we can't get together for, for Thanksgiving because of the, in, in, uh, the, 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 the fear that we'd have of the fights that might come up. Uh, and I, 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 I don't think I'm exaggerating, uh, unfortunately, with that. So I'm, I'm just saying that, that the, the, the focus of this uh, uh, encyclical is absolutely contrary to, <clears throat> excuse me, and is, is flat up against uh, the, uh, the divisions that we're feeling at this time. Okay, let's get into it, uh, David, if you would. So David, you're on the, you've got the old one there, I see. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, very good. Okay, so <clears throat> the, um, the, the introduction, um, and this, uh, Francis does not like spheres. He likes polyhedrons. Now, isn't that a fancy term? Um, but, but a polyhedron illustrates what he has in mind when he thinks of unity. Uh, and, and he's talking about not just Christian unity, but the unity of humankind. Uh, again, the next slide, if you would please, Dave. So there's, there's a polyhedron, okay? I remember, Francis is a Latin American, and uh, it's a soccer ball, not a basketball, okay? Uh, it looks more like a soccer ball. The point of a polyhedron and why Francis chooses polyhedron, and he brings it up in Fratelli Tutti, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, the reason that uh, he wants a polyhedron is if you'll notice, it's one, okay? But look, look at each surface has a little different tilt to it a little different view of reality. And that, is, and that is what Francis says is absolutely essential uh, to a sense of community. Community is not everybody thinks the same. Community is we respect, we, we hold, we champion, and we invite different perspectives. But we are still together. We are one, but we have different perspectives. That, that's not where we are today. Where we are today is you're either you know, red or you're, or you're blue. You know? uh, it's, 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 uh, it, it, there, there isn't this sense of a oneness. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, and again, skip that one if you would. You're, you, that's OK. All right. So what, what, what Francis is, um, I'm going to say a bit more about this. To compare this notion of, of uh, a polyhedron versus a sphere or concentric circles, uh, particularly this notion of sphere. Um, in, the, in, the, in the Roman world, uh, particularly at the time of Jesus, okay, Rome was expanding its empire over the whole world, okay? And the notion was universal. And by universal was meant everybody the same. Universe is from the Latin, one voice. We will all speak the same way. We will have one voice and it'll be a Roman voice and we will have Roman law and you will pay tribute to Rome. And so this, this notion of the, of the sphere as a sense of unity uh, is, is, is what Francis says is problematic. It means everybody has to be the same. And so he makes a big contrast between polyhedron and sphere. This is in, uh, this business of the polyhedron comes up in several of his works, uh, although, as I say, he does mention it here as well. Okay, David, the next uh, slide, if you would, please. And here again, uh, he says, if globalization is a sphere, where each point is equidistant from the center, then it isn't good because it annuls each of us. 
There's no identity. We are all one. We are the same. But if globalization joins us as a polyhedron, where we're all together, but conserves the energy of each, that's good. OK, David? Thank you. So the, this is a quote from Francis. I have frequently called for the growth of a culture of encounter capable of transcending our differences and divisions. This means working to create a many faceted polyhedron whose different sides form unity. And that is from there. So let's go to the next slide. So we'll get right into it now. Uh, Fratelli Tutti, brothers and sisters, 3rd October, the encyclical letter on fraternity and social friendship. The next slide, please. So very briefly, uh, the, there are eight chapters uh, and they begin, first of all, he is raising the issue that I'm raising tonight, dark clouds over a closed world. This attempt in a, in a kind of a Roman uh, military fashion uh, to impose one view and globalism has often been criticized because that's what's attempted to do. And he talks about dark clouds over a closed road. And then, and then in chapter two, very interestingly enough, uh, he talks about a stranger on the road and, and, and what this particular uh, uh, is, is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And he spends the whole chapter taking that parable and giving a much deeper meaning to it. And obviously, you know the parable, um, it's, it's not the priest or the Levite, you know, it's not the Jewish uh, folk that, that, that uh, Jesus comes from, but it's a stranger, a Samaritan, an other, uh, who is the person who best expresses what it means to be neighbor, what it means to be brother, what it means to be one with another. And that is a dominant um, uh, parable, an image that then Francis uses uh, throughout the encyclical. <clears throat> Chapter three is envisioning and engendering an open world. Uh, Chapter four, a heart open to the whole world. And so, when you get into chapter four, you, you start to see what he's calling for is conversion. That what has to happen in order for divisions to fall is conversion. Chapter five, a better type of politics, okay? Um, if anybody ever told Francis, you gotta keep religion and politics separate, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, what, what, what we are about is the creation of the world and the creation of society, and that's the polis, that's the city. And what we're about as followers of Jesus is to bring about the kingdom of God, the city of God, if you like. Uh, so uh, he, he then talks about better type of politics. And then he gets into, in chapter six, the, the, the key to what ends divisions, and that's dialogue and friendship in society. And dialogue is, is, is the real challenge of this encyclical. Uh, chapter seven, paths to a renewed encounter. And, and again, back to John's story, that, that, that what the church is about is encounter. Notice, notice when Father John told his, his story right there at the beginning. You know, he said at about seven o'clock at night, you know, they'd done their work and, and, and the the priests sort of went off to, uh, to, uh, to, to, their, to their bedrooms uh, and that was it, you know? And, and um, John said, no, I, I couldn't do that. I wanted to go out. I wanted to encounter. And, and, and that's that when you, when you eventually get and you see Francis's own church as we, we will the next time when we're together, what is enabled is encounter with people. Church is not what goes on inside the building. Church is when you leave the building and you're in relationship. And, and, and therefore, in, in Francis's mind, as far as the Catholic Church is concerned, you don't really have church 
until you're outside the doors. That's when, quote, church, or to use John's term, community happens. And then finally, uh, chapter eight does talk about religions at the service of fraternity in our world. Now, um, I, I, at this point, let me just say, he uses the plural in that title, religions. He, he's, he's not um, uh, focusing strictly on, on Catholicism or the Catholic Church, although he's very clear, and those are the references that he works from. But this, this document was written because of his work uh, originally in, um, in, in um, uh, the uh, Arab Emirate Republics, where he was meeting with uh, imams from there, and they've signed some joint statements. And he, he makes it very clear that, that his, he is being resourced in his work by his, his, uh, his, his interfaith work. OK, uh, David, please. And next slide. OK, um, let's start right from the beginning. So the title, Fratelli Tutti, OK? Uh, it is with these words, and this is, where, this is a quote now from Fratelli Tutti. It is with these words that St. Francis of Assisi addresses his brothers and sisters and proposes to them a way of life marked by the flavor of the gospel. So in other words, listen to this opening. It's not just we are together, we are one. It is that. We are one. But we are one with a way of life. And that way of life is marked by the flavor of the gospel. And the gospel, of course, is the story of Jesus, which is a story of someone for others. OK. In his simple and direct way, St. Francis express this is this again is from Fratelli Tutti. In his simple and direct way, St. Francis expressed the essence of a fraternal openness that allows us to acknowledge, appreciate, and love each person, regardless of physical proximity, regardless of where he or she was born or lived. This 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 idea, in other words, fraternity isn't just a nice phrase. It, 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 it's deep. It's a, it's a conversion of heart that talks about uh, uh, acknowledging, appreciating, and loving each person. That is an incredible challenge for us right now in this country. I, I, I can't say more. OK, next, please. So a key phrase in in the um, uh, encyclical is relationality, and he says, "For us, the wellspring of human dignity and fraternity is the gospel of Jesus Christ. From it, there arises for Christian thought and for the action of the church the primacy given to relationships." The primacy given to relationship, to the encounter with the sacred mystery, the other, to universal communion with the entire human family as a vocation of all. Listen to those phrases. The primacy of relationship. Now that, that, that's not new to us, particularly as Catholics. OK, what what is our aim in terms of our worship? It's to have a relationship. And we we even talk and we we die far and we hold up the notion of real presence. That that's our tradition. But Francis wants us to see that that real presence that we celebrate inside a building is just a sign of and an in incentive for the, 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 the relationship to the other and to a universal communion with the entire human family as a vocation of all. OK, David. 
So he says, uh, human beings are so made that they cannot live, develop, and find fulfillment except in the sincere gift to others. At this point, um, Francis is really delving into psychology. And, and he's saying that, that, that human development, full development, only happens in the sincere gift of self to others. And, and uh, if Paul were giving this lecture as he should be, um, Paul, as a psychologist, would be able to give you chapter and verse of psychological theory that upholds this notion. Nor can they fully encounter themselves apart from an encounter with other persons. We become persons by our relationship with others. It's that's how we develop a personality. That's how we develop an identity. That's how we find out who we are. It's an encounter with others. So, so the Pope is dealing with some very fundamental notions of what relationship is. Okay. And this, this, this is a hard uh, slide for me to read um, and I'll say why. Closed groups and self-absorbed couples that define themselves in opposition to others tend to be expressions of selfishness and mere self-preservation. And I, I want to, I want to take a moment to just share something personally at this time. Um, in uh, Nashville, um, oh my gosh, it's, it's um, a good 25 years ago. Uh, we kind of were following the path that, uh, that Father John has talked about tonight and that we, we formed a small ecclesial community. And amazingly, that group of 10 uh, individuals, five couples, has met every other Sunday for 25 years. And it's, you can just imagine uh, what that's like. And finally with COVID, we've done the Zoom thing, you know, and we're still meeting. What's happened, however, is in these times, it's been amazing there's been a real sense of division, some division within the group itself, which we have not been able to handle. But we've also come to experience in each of our families, tremendous division between ourselves and family members and, and, and others who, who don't think like we do. And it's just, you know, as I, as, I, as I go through this encyclical and go back to this experience of a, self, a sense of identity and a sense of community, it, this, this particular phrase out of Fratelli Tutti really um, does uh, hit me hard. Closed groups and self-absorbed couples that define themselves in opposition to others, he says, tend to be expressions of selfishness and mere self-preservation. I have to say, in, in all honesty, that really hits me in the face. And I'm not sure, even in our group, we're ready to discuss that. But, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, 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 to talk about the reality that I think this encyclical ad addresses in the world itself, where we are today. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's just the, the division is incredible. And, and obviously there's a tremendous division if you're following anything in the religious press, a division among the bishops and, and within our own Catholic church today. So this is a, this is a, tough, a tough piece from the, uh, from the, uh, from the encyclical. And, I, and again, I, I would ask you, you know, to reflect on that yourselves and see if that is your experience and if that, if that, if that evokes for you some concerns about this incredible division uh, that uh, that that I'm I'm referring to. Okay, next uh, uh, slide, please, David. So community, this is a big theme, um, and uh, again, I think I think John, I love John's opening in terms of thou art 
Peter, and upon this rock I will build my community, um, as the proper translation. Um, truly a worldwide tragedy like the COVID-19 pandemic momentarily revived the sense that we are a global community. Everybody has it, every country uh, on earth. Uh, apparently North Korea must be an exception or so it says. Uh, once more, we realize that no one is saved alone. We can only be saved together. So again, the, you know, the, this obviously is a timely uh, piece. It's written in the middle of the pandemic. And that's, 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 that's what occurs to, to, to Francis is the realization that we are in fact a global community and no one is saved alone. And that's the challenge, obviously, that we have today. You know, are we going to hoard the, uh, the, the vaccine? Uh, is Canada going to hoard the vaccine? I understand Canada has a huge stock. You know, what, 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 are, what are our individual nations going to be like? In, are we going to break the polyhedron? Will we not have that kind of unity? OK, next, please. So Francis says, if we go to the ultimate source of the love, which is the very life of the triune God, we encounter the community of three persons, the origin and the perfect model of all life in society. Uh, toward the end, when we come to uh, the focus on the renewal of the, of the church, we're going to come back to this triune sense that 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 uh, that Francis has, um, and I'll I'll say more about that uh, at that time. So the next one. Francis talks about the culture of encounter, and he has these are these are actual quotes. He has in in the in the uh, in the encyclical. Isolation, no. Closeness, yes. Culture clash, no. Culture of encounter, yes. Uh, it is neither a culture of confrontation nor a culture of conflict which builds harmony within and between peoples, but rather it's a culture of encounter, a culture of dialogue. This is the only way to peace. So again, I'm, I'm going back to the images that, that John gave us in the beginning and, and, and you and start to think of, of, of the, the rooms that he visited and the stories he told us. You know, um, these, are, these are people of encounter. You know, uh, these, are, these are people that are, 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 are alive and, and with each other. They may, they may be certainly poor, their homes may be kind of wretched, but that's, that's not what John notices. That's not what's apparent. What's apparent is this tremendous sense of encounter um, and even the celebration of dancing by taking the, the food on their heads and then dancing to the woman. You know, it's, 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 there's, there's a whole rhythm of encounter that you can only imagine goes on here. Okay. So he gets now to the point the ability to sit down and listen to others, typical of interpersonal encounters, is parada uh, paradigmatic, is the model of the welcoming attitude shown by those who transcend narcissism and accept others, caring for them and welcoming them into their lives. We must not lose the ability to listen. And and that you know the pictures say a lot here, um, you know just 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 thinking in your own for those of you that that have have partners and spouses, think of think of 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 how many times you've had to do what's there on the right, you know, all right, all right, we're not getting along, you know, you're not listening to me, um, all right, all right, I'll listen to you. Let me see if I can hear what you say. And all the practice that we go through in making sure that we actually hear the person, hear the feelings, you know, 
And then when that, when that happens, the other person is receptive to us and to hearing. And we know that as, as, as couples, um, how, 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 how absolutely uh, essential dialogue is to the balm that, that brings us back together when there's been a, a fracture. And, and, and stay with that for a moment. Think of that, not just between the two of you, you know, but between you and your neighbor. And, and maybe between you and the neighbor who voted a different ticket than you did. Hard as that is to see today for some of us. Hard as that is to see. Okay, the next. So this is where Francis um, talks about the need for, uh, repeating what I've just kind of got, got at there, the need for and power of dialogue. This is why we need to communicate with each other, to discover the gifts of each person, to promote that which unites us. And again, go back to the polyhedron, okay? You know, my surface and the way I look at the world is quite different from my wife's surface and the way she looks at the world. We clash all the time. Um, but, 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 but when we finally start to hear each other, and particularly when I hear her, you know, all of a sudden I discover, oh, wow, that's a very different way of looking at things. Look at how you come at things. It's not how I come at things. And, 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 and to see that not as because it's not my way, it's the wrong way, but as, wow, that's rich, that's different. And so I, 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 I think what, what, what Francis is getting at here is this, this discover the gifts of each person to promote that which invites us, or unites us rather, and to regard our differences as an opportunity to grow in mutual respect. And again, as you can see from the pictures, Francis is addressing this <clears throat> on, a, on a worldwide basis, and, and particularly this one with the different religious symbols, um, you know, and, and he's, he's, he's constantly promoting uh, this relationship with other uh, religious worldviews, or as he often says when he asks people to pray, and if, if you don't pray, you know, I respect that. And, and so whatever your view is, that would be like what I call prayer. You know, that, that, that kind of openness, not, oh, you know, you're condemned because you don't think the way I do. All right, uh, let's go to the next. So this is kind of ending um, uh, for the, the parts that we've pulled out of Fratelli Tutti. He's quoting um, in the in the encyclical the the words of the of the bishops of India. Uh, the goal of dialogue is to establish friendship, peace, and harmony, and to sharpen spiritual and moral values and experiences in a spirit of truth and love. Now, hopefully, in our discussion, we can really kind of you know get at some issues that maybe are very much on our mind, and that is, well, can you really dialogue with somebody who doesn't hold truth? And, and, and that, that'll be, that'll be a, a, a good question for discussion, perhaps. All right, this next uh, set of slides, um, now specifically, um, it, it sort of moves away, if you would, uh, from the, um, uh, the uh, encyclical, and I'm going to be brief about this, uh, but it does sort of lead us up into uh, our next uh, focus, and that is specifically on reforming uh, the Catholic Church. So uh, Paul and I uh, have been doing research together. We both retired about the same time, uh, which was roughly um, a little before uh, Francis um, uh, became Pope. And, um, and at the time we said, you know, we're both retiring. Let's, let, uh, let's continue to do, I was back from Chicago permanently. And he says, let's continue some of our work and our research. We've done a lot of, of work together. And, and immediately we, this was a, the, the occasion of the, um, of the 50th anniversary of, of Vatican II. There was a great book that came out that we were reading and it was called What Happened uh, at Vatican II, and we kind of tweaked the title, and we said, "Whatever happened to Vatican II?" Uh, and and so our concern was, "Hey, you know, we grew up 
uh, in the 60s. And uh, John the 23rd, you know, was a was a real hero for us. And and all the spirit that came out of the Vatican councils. And it seems now that uh, that things are not as vibrant. What's what's going on? And so we made sort of a, uh, our our focus. You know, what happened to Vatican II as our concern? Lo and behold, it wasn't six months later. Uh, Francis all of a sudden is made pontiff, and and we've spent we he and I meet together every Friday and for about two to three hours, and we do our research and our work and. And and all, and we we've made the the reform of the church, Francis reform of the church, as our uh, basic uh, thrust over all of this time. We've come up with these three uh, foci of Francis, okay, and and and, and again this this Trinitarian thinking of Francis. Um, it's been amazing if you if you've read any of the literature on Francis. Um, there, there are those who are uh, uh, conservative and, and very concerned about Francis. You know, says, oh my gosh, she's a liberal. He's going too far. Uh, on the on the on the liberal side of the church, uh, he has incredible critics. Come on, why aren't you ordaining women? Why aren't you, you know, uh, why aren't you getting with it? You know, and and so we've 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 realized that that Francis isn't going to be a pendulum swing back. If in fact we had a pendulum swing. To the uh, to the uh, liberal side of the church after Vatican II, and then during John Paul II and Benedict, that maybe the pendulum swing back a little bit to the conservative side. Francis is not just a new pendulum swing now to the to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the left. Francis is a third way. This okay. is still going on. I'm sorry. Pardon me. Oh, I think somebody got <laughs> muted there. Okay, so. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, the uh, what 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 we realize is that that he he's always thinking in threes. It's not either or. It's always and then. And so his 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 uh, sense of of uh, of being free is um, the the sense of uh, I'm sorry, the, a three is the sense of mercy, preferential option for the poor, and solidarity. Now, all of this is focused on. What he calls the kingdom or the reign of God. Okay. And so with the kingdom or the reign of God, um, he's talking about, again, as John talked about it, as a community of love and relationship. Okay. And again, there you see the polyhedron. In the next slide, uh, David. Did we lose you, David. Hello. I'm there. The we're ah. we're stuck. Oh, we're stuck, are we? Okay. Um, you know, actually, that's that's not bad. Um, we 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 uh, we can certainly uh, we we've we've gone through Fratelli Tutti. Uh, the the rest of this is is now focusing as a kind of a setup for our next uh, presentation, and we can simply begin the next presentation from this point on, David. I don't I don't think this is a, a problem. Don't worry about it. Okay. So let's uh, let's and, and that's nice because uh, uh, I'm getting hoarse and uh, we've got 25 minutes uh, to uh, to actually just do some dialogue uh, on all of this and and uh, so uh, maybe uh, to I think you've collected hopefully some questions and uh, if not my thought is why don't why don't we let uh, Father John uh, make some uh, comments or perhaps rebuttal Father if you'd like. Well, as a matter of fact, we don't have any questions right now. It sounds like people have been engaged in the presentation. Okay. Um, so if you'd like to add a question into the, into the chat, please do so. Or if you're comfortable and you want to unmute yourselves and ask either Father Trout or uh, Dr. Gorman a question, um, you're welcome to do so. I, I found quotation. If you don't mind, Father John, would you, would you just do some um, feedback here or, or uh, commentary? Yeah, I, I'd like to uh, give that quotation I was looking for about the small groups and being, being the presence of Christ. It, it, the quotation is, it is the flesh of Jesus in every time and place, the visible, incarnate, and enculturated sign of the presence of Jesus. So that was the quotation I was looking for to kind of, and I think uh, what, I, what we are trying to achieve here at St. Joseph's uh, Dave, how many people have we involved in these small groups? 
Uh, in the small group communities here, we have over uh, 340 people yeah. who are engaged in them in a multitude of almost uh, close to uh, 40 groups themselves. Yeah, over 40 groups, which is great. And um, what we, um, you know, what the ultimate goal of these groups and, and what uh, Pope Francis is talking about is, is making their environments, making where they live, because each, each group is, they have a, a responsibility to their neighborhood where they live and um, to make that um, a kinder place, to, to bring kindness into the world in which we live in. And, um, you know, we, we, we've seen some of the groups um, when we went on the initial lockdown, um, quite a few of them responded incredibly positively, um, especially towards the first responders to um, the people in nursing homes, um, people in hospitals, um, to show them that uh, they were appreciated and, um, and that they were, uh, um, and, and given like it was in, in some cases, um, I think at uh, Winchester House, one group or several groups sent over the, the staff there some lunches or, or, um, at different occasions, which, uh, which was deeply appreciated at that time because they were all dealing with the, the frontline workers who were dealing with COVID back then. So, um, so, so what we're hoping is for that, that the acts of kindness are not like, um, like a cuckoo clock, that they just come out now and again, but that it actually transforms the community in which we live in, that, it's a, that there is a, an atmosphere, a, a felt um, sense of kindness. It's like, I was talking to Father Karchi last week, and he said that, you know, when you come here to St. Joe's, you get a sense of welcome, a sense of warmth. And, and it's that sense that we want to, to grow and to bring out into the community in which we live in as well. Okay, Dave, are you... Want to open up for folks to ask questions if they want. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, are there any anyone who would like to offer a comment or have a question for either uh, Father or uh, Dr. Gorman? I guess while we're, uh, people are looking uh, to ask you one, Bob, um, I think one of the questions I'm sure the challenge when I looked over the summary for, for Tali Tutti and looked it over and was reading some of the key points from the Holy Father, um, especially on the issues of dialogue. Um, for a person who might approach you, might read that as well. Um, I, I think one of the, the challenges or things that I've reflected on was um, who initiates the dialogue first in the case, especially when you have some differences between you. And it could be, as we said, um, especially because here at St. Joseph's, we're also looking into the U.S. Bishop's letter of Open Wide Our Hearts, which tackles the differences in racism. Um, how does one who knows and senses those issues between another individual and yourself, be it somebody that you know, be it your neighbor or so, uh, how do you cross that boundary or in, even in your research, how, how does one do that or make the first step? Um, especially because I'm sure there are many people who might be wanting to, but have that reservation from fear of, if I stick my neck out here, um, will it get chopped off? Well, I don't know. Um, let, me, let me talk a little bit about, and maybe others could actually be more helpful here than I am. But, but one of the things that's occurred to me um, that has been a, a, a rather exceptional experience for us during the, uh, during the pandemic here at our parish in, in Nashville, Christ the King, um, the, um, the, the fellow who has your, your part uh, in, in our parish, Dave, um, a, a young man by the name of John Stotts, uh, found that people were coming to him and they were quite concerned about the, the death of, uh, of, of Floyd and the concern that that raised at the time, um, you know, that, that un unconscionably graphic uh, uh, video of, of, uh, of eight minutes. And um, so 
he he then we we what what has happened with that is there's been a, an attempt to 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 have a response to that and we had first of all so this is this was the, the methodology that that evolved for us uh, we had first of all several um, uh, meetings again over Zoom this was all over Zoom and uh, we we had several meetings and. There was a really a good number, a good turnout uh, for us of about 40 people. Generally on our adult ed, we have about 20. And so it was at least double. We had about 40 people uh, showing up and then he was putting us into small groups and all that. And we began to, to, to talk about our own reaction. And we began to talk about our, we're, we're an incredibly white parish. We, have, we actually happen to have an African-American pastor, but he's almost the only African-American in the church. And uh, we, we, we began to, 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 to talk about our experience. Uh, and, and anyway, it's a long story, but, but what happened was in those, when we began to have that conversation, all of a sudden people be, became aware of their own racism and people began to talk about that. Thought they never had racism, but then we, we, we and we did some readings, et cetera, that kind of moved us along. But then we, we eventually moved into five initiatives uh, that um, are, are, are going forward uh, right now. And um, one is more education and, and we've had some very good sessions on that. But another um, is, is actually having people tell their stories of what it was like to, uh, to grow up in a white community and what their experience was of reaching out to others. And, and we're publishing these stories online and more and more people are beginning to write these and they're, 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 they're really well done. And you're, you're starting to get this larger sense of, hey, I can identify with that. Then there's another initiative that we're working on that says, how can we reach out to our neighbor? How can we go outside that church door as a church <clears throat> and be in a greater relationship with others, particularly neighbors of color? And then, uh, and following up on that, sort of getting to, to Father John's point, and that is, and what can we do about, particularly as a parish, as a group, what can we do about some structural racism in Nashville? We have, we have um, uh, uh, a real issue in our public schools, and we talk about it as a, uh, a prison, uh, a, a school to prison pipeline, and uh, could go into all the understanding of that. But um, th there's, so there's, there's, and we have a, a, our own big Catholic school in our parish, and that's kind of where our focus has been. And we're saying, well, wait a minute, you know, let's, let's see about those folks that, that aren't from our parish, that can't afford this kind of education. Do we have any concern for that? That's a big issue for us. Uh, housing, uh, you know, food uh, 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 during the, uh, this time of pandemic, et cetera. So there's been, there's been that movement of, uh, you know, a, a, as well. And we've also, there's a couple others, but now I don't need to dwell on those. But I, all I'm saying is that what I, what I have begun to sense in this is, is with this, this initiative, there is an attempt to have church, in John's terms, outside the doors, you know, to have, to, 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 to have a sense of community where, where we can be in relationship and that that relationship produces some concern for those who, who are hard pressed. Wonderful, thank you. I, I think Dave, in my experience, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, in my experience is that the importance of, uh, before you enter into a, a difficult dialogue, the importance of building a relationship. And um, with the communities that the deeper the relationship, um, then the deeper, uh, the, the, the conversation that, that is allowed to take place. So, um, and sometimes you will be able to measure the depth of relationship in a family or in a community by the depth of conversation and dialogue that takes place within that. If it is superficial, it's likely that the relationships are superficial. And the more deeper and more difficult it is, then th there's a wonderful book that um, I got today, dropped off, uh, conversation, risk, and conversion. And uh, I think that sums it up, that to enter into um, having a real dialogue or conversation 
it, it takes on the risk. And the risk is that as a result of what you are hearing, you, your, your point of view will be changed. So it's conversation, risk, and conversion. Thank you, Richard. I'd be interested if anybody wants to um, kind of comment on, on the, this, this encyclical in light of the sense of division uh, that we have in, the, uh, in, the, in, in, in this country and, and actually within our own church today. Any, any thoughts or comments on that from anybody? Just a, a quick one that I might add, um, trying to put that within the, the context of what's going on right now with the pandemic. Uh, I think the Pope was also pointing out too that this is an opportunity an opportunity to deal with one of the ills that we have in society, and that's a, a culture of individualism. Uh, we tend to be isolated uh, as, as individuals and yet as countries. You spoke even of the potential hoarding. So I, I think that there's a, a, a real need here to take a look at that as a social ill from not just a political standpoint, but an individual standpoint. Uh, it, it, to me, it, it, it causes us to, or should cause us to reflect on his, for example, um, uh, uh, discussion of the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. What he said, and we've all heard the sermon and, and read the gospel many times, he pointed out one individual who was not there. And it was not just the person who was, you know, injured, but who injured that person? Hmm. Okay. Who injured that person? that was helped by the Samaritan. And, and a way to take a look at, you know, it's more than just doing something at that time. You know, what is it within our society? What is it within our culture that has created through the economics, through the materialism, through whatever it is that created that injury? So it, it's more than just helping and going out to what's needed, but it's going out and taking a look at what are some of the roots of the problem that have created some of those injuries. Yeah, well said. That that the the point being that and and you get into this a lot in the first chapter, the dark clouds, uh, what you're referring to, and it's 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 a real analysis of what's happening. You know, why why is it that we have division? You know, and and what are the systems that we're living under? What is the the the, the you know how 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 great is the sense of greed perhaps that that's apparent. He, and and you know in the in the in the chapter on politics he he doesn't uh, uh, pull any punches you know about talking about demagogue leaders uh, as being examples of this. Thank you. Anyone else from our audience with a, a comment or reflection on um, either the encyclical or anything that you heard in tonight's presentation? Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the presenters um, and uh, for presenting. Um, thank you, Father Trout. Uh, thank you, uh, Bob O'Gorman, uh, who is a friend of mine. I live in Nashville. Um, is everybody hearing me? Yes. Okay. Um, and um, it was just very nice to hear what the Pope is saying. And I would hope that um, we can listen to him and that our church will listen to him. Um, it's, it's interesting that your stories, Father Trout, go back to basic community um, and how far our world today is away from that. Um, and how do we have community without tribalism? And, and how do we really attempt to uh, heal division. Uh, right now, there's so much division. Bob spoke to it um, within the family, with the political, there's so much distrust. I'm wrong, uh, or I'm right, you're wrong. Uh, it's almost like everything's too raw to be able to accept or absorb this message. And yet, uh, if we attempt to embrace it, we can maybe begin to disarm polarity. And it starts right at our table at home. 
and then it extends to friends and trying to listen to the other. And then um, I'm very uh, encouraged by the uh, reference to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, and thank you, Scott, for your comment uh, about the one that's not in there. I had not ever really thought about it from that context, but the real notion is that ideal that so hard to achieve, but um, everyone's our neighbor. And, and that is so hard, that's like an ideal. How do we work toward that? Um, and do our institutions, which don't necessarily foster that, um, you know, and yet at the real root of, of what we're talking about is that the gospel should flourish in all that we do and how hard that is to have happen uh, within our church, within our community, within our nation. And so this is very encouraging. I hope our church will listen to it. And I thank you for um, opening me to, to, to this. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, if there's uh, any more questions, I'm sure there would have been up by now, but I, I think, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I was going to say we were nearing our time. So yeah. if, if everybody's perhaps we'll end with our concluding prayer um, in respect of everybody's time. Before, before you conclude, I would like to uh, thank you, Dave, for organizing this and to thank Bob and Paul also for, for the effort and the the commitment to put into this and, and for everybody who has joined us as well. Thank you all for being interested in this and, uh, and uh, we'll continue with the closing prayer. Father, will you do the honors, please? Okay, certainly. Oh God, Trinity of love, from the profound communion of your divine life, pour out upon us a torrent of fraternal love. Grant us the love reflected in the actions of Jesus, in his family of Nazareth, and in the early Christian community. Grant that we Christians may live the gospel, discovering Christ in each human being. Recognize him crucified in the suffering of the abandoned and the forgotten of our world, and risen in each brother or sister who makes a new start. Come Holy Spirit, show us your beauty, reflected in all peoples of the earth, so that we may discover anew that all are important and all are necessary, different phrases of the one humanity that God so loves. Amen. Amen. All right. And with that, that uh, concludes our program for this evening. Um, again, a thank you to our presenters, Father John Trout and Dr. Robert O'Gorman. Um, as I mentioned, we will uh, be uh, posting this recorded meeting uh, for those who like to review or recap some of it. And we will keep you posted uh, when we plan on uh, start putting together the plans for part two to continue breaking open uh, the universal us. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, all. Thank you ma'am.